Good morning. I'm Mary Lovely. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as the Anthony M. Solomon Senior Fellow here at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'd like to welcome you to today's session on, on Xi Jinping's economic model and the future of globalization. Obviously, that's a topic that we could spend a week on. We only have an hour and a half. We have a very rich program for you this morning. So thanks for joining us. We're delighted to be hosting um, guests, real people, back in the Peterson building. And we're delighted to welcome our online audience as we are streaming live on YouTube. So thank you to everyone here and there uh, for joining us this morning to discuss China's economic model. Before we begin, I want to thank the staff here at the Peterson Institute for their dedicated efforts behind the scenes from communications, set up, sanitizing the building to make sure we're all safe, and making sure that our live stream is top notch. We couldn't do this without them, and they really deserve our thanks. We have a rich program prepared for you this morning. I have learned so much from the people who are on this panel that I'm really delighted to share their wisdom, their views with a wider audience. So let's get right to it. Uh, Xi Jinping's China looks like a very different country than the one the US thought it understood in May 2000 when the US Congress voted in favor of permanent normal trade relations for China. Today, we hear a steady narrative about how China has changed, how its economic system is incompatible with Western capitalist economies, and how the West must withdraw from the relationship, at least in technology sectors to be sure. I've had the pleasure of serving as the Carnegie Chair in US-China Relations at the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress for the past nine months, and I can tell you that these tensions are very much present here in DC. In China, as she stands on the verge of an unprecedented third term as Chinese Communist Party secretary, the party state appears to be taking a more dominant role of economic affairs, even as the nation continues to fight COVID-19 and faces slower economic growth, at least in the short run. As a result of these tensions, many observers predict an inevitable US-China decoupling, and some even speak of the need to urgently avoid military conflict. We will hear much commentary in the coming days and weeks about China's unstoppable march toward tighter state control of the economy and society. But we have seen China change course before, and this narrative need not be the only or best forecast of how the next five years will unfold. This morning, we want to take a deeper look at the Chinese development model. We want to better understand the forces that have led to China's reinvigoration of party primacy and prioritization of security over growth. Our speakers this morning will review the path of China's engagement with the world economy and how that engagement has changed in response to both internal and external events. Let me briefly introduce our distinguished speakers in order um, of their appearance. Our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Yelling Tan. Dr. Tan is a non-resident senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute, so I'm delighted to say she's our new colleague. She's an assistant professor of political science at the University of Oregon. Her research lies at the intersection of international and comparative political economy with an emphasis on China and the developing world. Her recent book, Disaggregating China Inc., looks at how various parts of the state responded to China's WTO entry. We're delighted to have her here today in person, so thank you. Our second speaker will be Dr. Margaret Pearson. Dr. Pearson is Distinguished Professor and Distinguished Scholar Teacher in the Department of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland College Park. So she is, in a sense, our neighbor. Her research focuses on China's domestic politics, state control of the economy, central local bureaucratic relations, and environmental policy. Her most recent book is China's Multilateralism, Investing in Global Governance, written with Scott Kasner and Chad Rector. Our third speaker will be Martin Chorzempa. Martin is a senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute, where he writes about financial innovation, tech regulation, export controls, and investment restrictions. He is the author of the newly published The Cashless Revolution, China's Reinvention of Money, and we will be celebrating his book launch in the month ahead. 
Previously, Martin conducted research as a Fulbright scholar in Germany and a loose scholar in China. We will have two discussions this morning. Our first is my colleague, Tianlei Huang. Tianlei is a research fellow at the Peterson Institute, where he works on issues related to China's economy and development. Before joining the Institute, he worked at the Brookings Institution Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Our last speaker will be someone who barely needs introduction here at the Peterson Institute, Dr. Nick Lardy. We're very fortunate to have Nick today, and we're grateful that he'll be willing to comment on the previous remarks of our speakers. So without further ado, let me welcome Dr. Yellen Tan to the podium. Thanks very much, Mary, uh, for the kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here today. So in my remarks today, I'm going to outline some key turning points in China's external engagement, as you can see in this table here. And in doing so, I'll seek to make three main points. The first is that China has, China has long had a conflicted relationship with globalization, seeking to balance on the one hand between potential gains to be reaped from external engagement, while also shielding itself from potential vulnerabilities from external shocks. And secondly, seen in a longer context, China's current dual circulation strategy can most straightforwardly be seen as a formalization of a long-standing hybrid developmental model comprising export-led growth concentrated largely along the coast and state-led investment primarily focused on China's interior. Now, if dual circulation merely encapsulates long-standing patterns, then what is new in today's uh, economic policy in China? Uh, I'm going to end by speaking briefly about the securitization of economic policy, what it looks like, how it's different potentially from previous episodes of securitization, and uh, some of the uncertainties that lie ahead. So to begin uh, at the beginning, um, starting with reform and opening back in 1978, a lot of literature has already documented this, so I'm not going to speak too long about this. The main point I want to make here is that China's entry into a phase of rapid economic growth was actually not centered on trade uh, back in the 1980s. In fact, much of the explosive growth that China experienced in the 1980s was focused in the rural areas through agricultural decollectivization and rural industrialization. To the extent that China engaged with trade liberalization, it was through very circumscribed experiments in these special economic zones in the southeast. Now, the success of these zones led the um, export processing model to be, um, to be extended along the coast in the 1990s. But even then, this was by no means a full embrace of globalization. And, uh, and instead, China remained uh, in a bifurcated model when it came to external engagement in the sense that free trade was by and large located along the coast and dominated by foreign firms based in these export processing zones. In the rest of the country, in the interior, we had a different trading regime that was controlled through administrative guidances and trading licenses that were primarily allocated to state-owned enterprises, even while this was slowly being liberalized. So far, it sounds like a linear expansion of trade, but it was not, uh, not quite the story if we look at what happens next, which is the Asian financial crisis. Now, this regional crisis triggered a fall in foreign direct investment, as you can see in the graph here, as well as exports. And the um, deterioration of the regional environment then led China's leaders to reconsider the merits of China's uh, external dependence uh, as, as far as its growth models were concerned. And it's during this period that we start to, it's during this period that we start to see uh, 
the government moving towards uh, policies to boost domestic demand and doing so through state-led spending and doing this through policies to facilitate land transfers and land development. So infrastructure starts to um, increase very much during this period. Now in 2001, China doubles down on uh, export-led growth in its entry into the World Trade Organization. So this was a critical turning point for the global trading system and for China itself. And in my book, I document how the implementation process, however, was actually quite uneven um, and involved uh, a fair amount of bureaucratic resistant, uh, resistance within China's vast party state. Nevertheless, this entry into the WTO marked an abolition of the dual trading regime that I uh, mentioned earlier and marked China's movement from shallow to deep integration with the global economy in a shift towards much more export-led growth in its overall development model. Now, a, a mere seven years later, we have the global financial crisis. And here, again, we see the Chinese government reconsidering the merits of its growth strategy and the degree to which it should continue to be externally, externally dependent um, on, on um, foreign demand and the massive uh, fiscal stimulus that was rolled out by the Chinese government was largely channeled through SOEs as a lot of uh, literature has already documented and manifested itself in the form of a lot of infrastructure construction primarily concentrated in the interior provinces. This then leads to um, serious problems of local government debt and excess capacity. And a few years later, we see the Chinese government seeking to export some of this domestic excess capacity to uh, other countries in the form of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and in contrast to the export-led uh, period in the early WTO years, which primarily benefited domestic private firms in China as well as foreign firms, the political beneficiaries of the Belt and Road here are a little different. They tend to be more state-owned enterprises and provinces um, located in the west, southwest, and, and northwest of China. Now, the U.S.-China trade and technology tensions that erupted in 2018 represented yet another external shock. And here we can see the Chinese government responding in three different ways. First, it sought to defend itself by launching retaliatory tariffs against the United States. Secondly, it sought to diversify its economic relationships by deepening trade engagement um, with Asian countries, for example, through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And thirdly, it sought to decouple um, itself from the United, States in, the United States in terms of sensitive technology. So there's been, on the one hand, um, an effort to diversify trade, and on the other hand, an effort to emphasize and boost self-reliance particularly in critical technology. As you see in this graph here, uh, which is part of ongoing work that shows an increase in discourse in China's official media and language related to decoupling. So phrases related to self-reliance, choke points, and technological in independence increasing as China, uh, China's um, technology tensions with the United States increase from 2018 onwards. Again, what this figure shows is the, uh, a shift in elite thinking within the Chinese government to viewing integration now much more as a source of vulnerability as opposed to a source of uh, growth and opportunities. So that brings us up to date to the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, current dual circulation strategy that's been announced by the Chinese government. Now, seen in this longer context that I've just provided, uh, we can understand dual circulation as a fairly straightforward doctrinal formulation, formalization of longstanding concerns within the Chinese government seeking to find some kind of, to calibrate and find some sort of balance between gains from globalization and vulnerability to external shocks. However, while uh, dual circulation sounds good on paper, it is easier said than done. 
to be able to achieve a calibration at the national level between external dependence and domestic self-reliance is going to requ uh, require cooperation from numerous local governments all of whom are locked into their respective growth models already, be it export-led growth or state-led investment. And the options for them to shift away from this um, are, are few and far between, especially when we consider the additional pressures that the Chinese government is facing right now from local debt problems, as well as its dynamic zero COVID policy. So whether or not dual circulation will succeed uh, remains to be seen. However, many of these concerns are long-standing. So what then is new in Chinese economic policy? Well, the securitization of Chinese economic policy uh, is a fairly new development, and we can see this most uh, starkly in Xi Jinping's speech launching the 14th Five-Year Plan back in 2021, wherein he mentions the term security 17 times in the course of a fairly short speech. And this is in stark contrast to his speech for the 13th five-year plan back in 2016, where he mentions the term security only five times and in far less, um, uh, in a context that, that is uh, far less hostile. In his speech, he makes clear that security has been elevated to the same plank as development and that security is now, security concerns are now deeply uh, intertwined with developmental priorities. If we look back in history far enough, however, it will be clear that securitization itself is not necessarily new. Um, we have to remember that the CCP was founded 101 years ago in a context where the foreign trading environment was extremely coercive and extremely hostile. And it's also not the first time that China has faced um, a situation where its access to foreign technology has been suddenly restricted by a foreign power. So how is China responding to the securitization today? Well, it's seeking to mobilize much of its uh, domestic bureaucracy. We see it uh, reaching back to past episodes of external co coercion in, in its own history and using these past episodes in its um, domestic discourse and we see the term struggle, for example, being deployed multiple times, both in policies and in media discourse, uh, and trying to rouse the fighting spirit of the domestic bureaucracy in the quest for China's techno technology independence. We also see the Chinese government seeking to reconfigure existing domestic institutions to build a, uh, an innovation system that's much more centered on uh, domestic actors in the form of uh, what's loosely translated as a whole of nation approach or a whole of nation system. As with dual circulation, whether or not this new approach uh, towards a more closed innovation uh, architecture will succeed remains to be seen because this kind of whole of nation approach requires the cooperation of a huge diversity of actors from private firms to universities and research institutes and so on. And whether or not their incentives are aligned with national policy remains to be seen. So to conclude, um, if we look back um, at China's recent uh, decades of economic reform and opening, it's clear that China has never fully embraced globalization. It's always had a slightly conflicted relationship with how the, the degree to which it, it's wanted to open up. Dual circulation encapsulates these tensions, but whether or not it's going to succeed remains to be seen. There are major obstacles, including um, requiring cooperation from local governments. And what's new in terms of securitization, um, uh, what's new is this turn towards securitization in Chinese economic policy. Again, how this plays out remains unclear as it will also require cooperation from a diversity of actors within the Chinese system. And with that, I thank you very much.
Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary, and to the Peterson Institute for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, this uh, work that I'm presenting is based on co-authored work with my colleagues Meg Rithmeyer from Harvard Business School and Kelly Sai from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, we are in this work trying to explore the dynamics underlying the real intensification of um, tensions between China and OECD countries in the realm of economy, uh, a place where we haven't really seen this amount of tension uh, previously. So what uh, the, the main steps of our argument is that uh, economic interdependence is expected generally, or has long been expected, at least in theory, to pacify and produce cooperation among states. But in recent years, economic interdependence, um, and especially with firms at the center of uh, of them, uh, of economic interdependence, has been a point of major security conflict, or I'll be using also this phrase securitization that Yelling uh, introduced us to. So we argue that these trends are rooted, uh, at least in part, in changes to China's domestic political economy model. Uh, and we, I think I'll focus the bulk of my attention this afternoon, uh, this morning anyway, on the backlash that it has sparked uh, in the form of unilateral and coordinated efforts of OECD countries to constrain large and strategic Chinese firms. So we start with the, the, an observation that in many ways what's going on in the economic realm resembles a classic security dilemma. Uh, and it, just to remind you of what that means, uh, the security dilemma suggests that state A's efforts to increase its security produce alarm in other states, uh, generating a spiral that decreases the security of state A, and indeed we could argue of, of other states as well. And key in this uh, dilemma dynamic uh, is uncertainty about intentions of each other and uncertainty about the capabilities of each actor. So uh, just the, to sort of give you the broad sweep of it, um, we would uh, argue, we do argue, that China began, uh, as Yelling has really laid out well for us, uh, in the mid to late 2000s to begin to perceive uh, after sort of a heyday of globalization, per began to perceive threats to regime security. It took actions uh, and policies to securitize the economy. For us, a key linchpin here is the uh, increased blurring of the boundary between firms and the state, or in particular, the perceptions of this blurred boundary by other countries. Um, this has, as I said, created a security dilemma dynamic between China and its uh, wealthy trading partners uh, that has been characterized by anx anxieties about mutual intentions and capabilities, as I said, and has resulted in substantial background. So uh, without spending too much time here, because it overlaps a fair amount with what Yiling has said, um, in the late 2000s, um, in particular, the Chinese Communist Party began to identify internal and external threats. Uh, Yelling has talked about some of the deep, uh, deeper historical concerns. Uh, we focus on the global financial crisis, uh, the slowing of growth, and the need to find a new normal uh, in economic policy, in partly driven by the fear of reliance on global supply chains, especially for critical inputs. Uh, this concern, uh, manifested in the mid-2000s uh, uh, mid uh, with the medium and long-term plan for science and technology, and then subsequently in the, the follow-on uh, plans for indigenous innovation, and ultimately um, leading to the Made in China 2025 policy. And then in terms of very specific security threat, there was quite a lot of alarm raised in China over the Snowden WikiLeaks revelations that the US National Security Council had uh, created a backdoor into Huawei servers. So a perception of threats from a, by the Chinese uh, leadership from both um, interdependence and also some specific security threats tied to this interdependence. <clears throat> 
And this resulted in a shift in China's domestic political economy model. Um, this shift, I think we would not say is global throughout the economy, so I want to scope it a little bit by suggesting that uh, the kind of small and medium um, sector, uh, the small and medium private sector in particular, uh, has largely sort of remained outside of the scope of this threat, and so we're really focusing primarily on large, large firms, uh, whether private or state-owned, uh, and also those that we could deem as being of strategic value. And this model, we would um, argue, has shifted sort of from a focus on growth and by global engagement and to a securitization of economic governance. So here are some examples uh, here also uh, repeating uh, what Yiling said um, in, and noting the increased use of the word security attached to nearly everything. Um, and also there is a suite of laws that have been passed that uh, are linking together ideas of firm behavior and economic behavior and uh, national security. So we've called this uh, new model party-state capitalism. A number of different um, labels could be given to it. Uh, we've had all sorts of suggestions of better things to call it, but this is what we, we landed on. Um, we point to several signature features. One is amplified state control of firms in both the state and private sector. Many people have commented on the uh, expansion of party cells in firms that uh, the Xi Jinping's um, great desire to have the party represented in explicit ways in all firms, um, state-owned, private, and foreign, and have some kind of membership by the party on boards. I think the impact of this is, is quite unclear at this point, but it certainly has been an expansion of um, party presence anyway. Uh, there have been many uh, new financial instruments for state control that go beyond majority ownership. So if we can understand the uh, Chinese uh, state as previously having relied primarily on its ownership position in firms as a kind of means of, of, of monitoring and control, uh, now we see a great uh, mixture of other kinds of possible controls by the party, the mixed investment reforms, um, uh, and the, the kind of great, at least, confusion to the outside of the um, kind of ownership structures of many firms. I will point you to the really marvelous paper uh, by Tian Lei Huang here and his colleague Nicolas Veron uh, that came out in March of this year that really talks about the private sector but very helpfully lays out some of this um, uh, mixture of investment uh, types in firms. Uh, we've seen uh, some emergence of state-backed capital investment funds, particularly in the IC sector, uh, not necessarily state-driven, but a kind of a combination of state and private funds, uh, and the emergence of special management shares, at least in the media and the technology or platform economy sector. And then uh, the third signature feature we point to is the demand for political fealty by firms, uh, asking for recitation of political loyalty to the party uh, inside China by firms, and then also uh, suggesting or uh, enforcing uh, the exchange of market access or threats to deny market access to foreign firms unless they uh, are adhering to certain kinds of political norms. <clears throat> so we focus on Again, this idea that majority state ownership is no longer seen as necessary for the control of firms. And a crucial result of this is the blurring of boundaries, uh, at least as perceived from, by the outside world, or the lack of clarity as to where the party state ends and firms begin. So if we now turn to the overseas side, uh, this these blurred boundaries and a lot of these other moves and laws, I should say too, uh, is seen as evidence of China's changed intentions to exert greater control over its economic actors and a willingness to use firms to enhance its capabilities. And this has, as we all know, led to tremendous backlash. Uh, very telling quote, for example, by uh, Senator Cornyn, 
There's no real difference between a Chinese state-owned enterprise and a private firm in terms of the national security risks that exist when a company, part, U.S. company partners with one. And very often in a lot of the new uh, rules and laws as they're debated, this idea that there is, uh, you know, any firm in China could be an agent of the Chinese state is very often raised as a, um, uh, a reason for passing these now securitized U.S. Firms. I'll just mention a, a couple of ones that, a, a couple of kinds of actions um, focused on the US, um, primarily where we see uh, the US reaction here to China's securitization. And I would say this is uh, securitization on the US side as well. So the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act has uh, gone through several um, expansions, uh, has, has, was passed in 2018 and has gone through several um, stages of expanding the CFIUS purview uh, to broaden CFIUS's purview. The executive order last week uh, by President Biden uh, is directed CFIUS to consider additional security factors. I know there's a lot of commentary that says this doesn't give CFIUS any new powers uh, and ask them to do anything very different, but it is uh, really a strong signal uh, to the um, to CFIUS, you know, that this security perception, this security issue, should be front and center in in their reviews. In outbound investment, very uh, interesting. So the idea that the U.S. government should screen uh, investments leaving the U.S. or screen the use of U.S. capital outside of China. Um, uh, in 2020, there was a link to um, uh, investment screening for firms said to be linked to the PLA. Uh, in 2021, uh, surveillance technology was sort of brought into this. Uh, the scope of this as well. And then uh, I think many in Washington are expecting very soon a screening regime for outbound investments um, to be um, either re-upped or expanded in some way. Martin, maybe you can say more to us about that. Um, there's also been a tremendous amount of institutional evolution in uh, the U.S. Uh, industrial policy. I don't need to remind us of all. Uh, you know, perhaps the government was... <clears throat> Uh, felt emboldened by the success of the vaccine industrial policy to sort of say, now we can use this as a tool uh, for everything that we want. Uh, and certainly we have begun uh, down this road of industrial policy. Um, and also try to um, increase the coordination with transatlantic partners to uh, coordinate standards on um, sensitive technology. So uh, again, an interesting quote here, uh, like NATO, you know, this new US EU trade and technology council would be like NATO, right? But for economic threats, you know? So just a, a couple of closing thoughts here. Um, I would, I would emphasize that the securitization of economic independence has involved the rethinking of, uh, I say, sacred uh, distinction between state and private ownership. I'm a little sarcastic with that, but it, you know, to some degree, this idea that you knew what you were getting in the West with a private firm, and you knew what you were getting with a state firm, now this sense of we know what we're getting has been very um, uh, muddied, uh, again, at least in perceptions. We would also note the increased targeting of firms as agents of state policy. I think this, this specific effort to control China's government through controlling its firms is, is something of a different uh, direction or a much expanded direction, even though we have occasionally seen it in the past. I think a lot of these um, policies and institutions uh, evolve us away in the U.S. anyway, away from liberalism and to statism as the basis of economic order in advanced economies. Uh, one might see an, um, uh, an irony in that. Uh, and in U.S.-China relations, this turn to you know, focus on security above all or securitize every part of the relationship. Um, it's a couple of interesting features. Uh, for one, it exposes a deep irritation in the U.S. government about firms lobbying in their interest. Right? You know, don't they understand that they're undermining national security? U.S. business is so naive to want to stay in this very dangerous uh, realm and so forth. Uh, so 
Uh, that's quite interesting to me. And then also, uh, increasingly, our narrative critiques Chinese firms as agents of the state, um, but many of the policies seem to want to make US firms agents of the state, or at least it would seem that they may wish to do that. So I hope some provocative um, thoughts there and look forward very much to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yelling and Margaret. Um, that was really a fascinating, brief, yet comprehensive, somehow you squeeze so much into a short period of time, review of the changes in China's economic model and its heightened emphasis on security. Uh, now we're gonna turn to a more narrow focus, um, looking at how China has moved to regulate its big tech. And this, I think, is very appropriate given that uh, Margaret has just spoken about the renewed emphasis on large firms inside China. So if there's a new emphasis on large firms, why do they seem to be taking a particularly heavy hand? Uh, so next, we're going to have Martin Trezempa talking about building or destroying value, China's moves to regulate big tech. Martin. Thank you, Mary. And it's great to be here after a long pandemic uh, break to be at this, at this podium where I've had uh, a lot of fun times giving speeches. And this is about the perfect time to be talking about this subject because we're almost exactly two years after Jack Ma stood at a very different podium to give a very controversial speech to Chinese regulators and political authorities that ended up being the speech that brought a thousand, launched a thousand regulations. Here's a nice photo of Jack Ma looking at Pony Ma. I think Pony has this kind of exasperated expression like, oh, I can't believe what you're about to do in only a few months. I'm going to talk about what China's done to its tech sector, effects on startup investment, comparison with other countries, and some of China's past political economy, and then go into long-term impact. Uh, so I thought the easiest way to describe how this, uh, these regulations have had an effect is to look at a little bit of a timeline of the actions China's taken on the left, and then on the right is the market cap of some of China's largest uh, technology companies, especially the platform companies like Alibaba and Tencent and, um, and some others. So what sticks out here is that when Jack Ma gives his speech in October of 2020, and then the, in response, the Chinese government uh, cans its IPO and ends up launching a bunch of punitive regulations. You see that it's, this is the green line, its market capitalization declines quite quickly. So it looks to investors like this is something that is really hitting Alibaba hard. But what's very interesting is that if you look at Tencent, its value actually continues to increase. So there's not a sense of perception from investors yet that this is going to be a widespread crackdown. That really changes in December of 2020 when the Politburo announces it's going to prevent the, uh, the disorderly expansion of capital and expand anti-monopoly work. And this is a major shift in regime. Uh, I read a book about China's antitrust policy from Angela Zhang that uh, came out quite recently, and there's not a single mention of a single investigation in related to monopoly of Alibaba or Tencent uh, up until about this time. It is extraordinary that these firms manage to get so large with so little scrutiny. But then once that announcement comes out, you watch how there's this quick march downward in market capitalization of these firms. And it takes a little while for the bureaucracy to manage to come out with a set of new regulations in cybersecurity, data security, data privacy, security reviews, anti-monopoly. But as they come out with more and more regulations following the Chinese government's push, and clear political signal that they should be hard on these firms, the values go down quite precipitously. Uh, but already in late 2021, we start to see a little bit of a sense that uh, they might be taking things too far. So as Xi Jinping's speech at that point says, it's not just about regulation, we need two strong hands. One of them is helping push development of these firms, continuing to have them serve China's interests, but also with more regulatory uh, scrutiny. And then in March of 2022, when the economy starts deteriorating quite significantly and the market value of these and other firms also deteriorates uh, a lot, uh, Liu He comes out with a statement saying we need green lights, not just red lights. We need transparent regulation, kind of rebukes the regulators for going a little bit too far. 
But you'll notice that the market cap of these firms continues to go down after this speech. So it doesn't end. What happened is it settles down a little bit, but there are continue to be regulations that are being implemented as a result of the laws that they've passed, investigations they've launched. Uh, and that, that means this is not some sort of temporary decline, but a permanent shift into uh, a different regime. Now, you can tell one story. So it, looking back at that chart, there's in only Alibaba, uh, Tencent, and Meituan, the three largest platform economies, there's been $1 trillion in market capitalization that's been simply destroyed since the, the peak when, when this campaign began. Now, you can tell one story if you're the Chinese government that, well, that is a decline in market rents and comp anti-competitive behavior. But what's going to happen is there are going to be all these new startups that are going to come in and fill the gaps and compete with these firms in ways that they were not before because of this anti-competitive behavior. What we're seeing is this is not the case. So 2021 was a bit surprising because during the time that there was this storm of regulation, venture capital investment actually held up quite well in China. That is the lower uh, dark blue bar. But interestingly, there was actually more venture capital activity abroad. So China's share of global venture capital went down. So all across the world, we have very loose financial conditions, good, fast recovery in growth after the pandemic began to calm down. Uh, but those conditions ended up creating more growth in the rest of the world than they did in China, a sign that the tech crackdown was a bit of a headwind for these kind of investments. And then if you look at the second quarter of 2022, you see a huge divergence in the world and the Chinese trends. It was the worst quarter for venture capital in China in eight years, whereas if you look at the global numbers, they actually look quite good despite the you know, more tight monetary policy, a little bit lower, uh, lower growth. And this is to a great extent due to zero COVID and factors other than regulation, but regulation has played uh, a part. Now, it's interesting to compare China to other countries. Uh, some of the previous speakers did a, did a little bit of this. What I find interesting is the way that the European Union uh, political leaders, the way that the Biden administration and the way that Xi Jinping talk about the challenges from the dominant position of internet platforms is almost identical. If you read these quotes, it's very hard to tell which one is which. The one that Xi Jinping is the one that's talking about the lawful interests of consumers and users of platforms, something you wouldn't necessarily uh, expect. So comparison with other jurisdictions, though, this is not something that is the same across. Uh, one difference is that China's storm really wouldn't be possible in a country with rule of law. So they're able to act quite decisively. But I think what we've seen in the previous two charts is that a lot of this decisive action risks overreach and creating too much uncertainty at one time. It was just as an observer not having to comply with any of these regulations, it was nearly impossible to keep up with and create a timeline of what was coming out. Now, if you imagine you're a firm that has to comply with all these things, or maybe your privacy officer will go to jail, or you'll receive a multi-billion dollar fine, that creates major challenges. And if you're in the government, how do you build the capacity to actually implement this really granular internet regulation? That's a major challenge as well. And then, of course, as was discussed in the previous two uh, presentations, more focus on ideological control than in other jurisdictions. But it's also consistent with longstanding trends in China's political economy. We see these campaign style crackdowns often as a result of correcting what's perceived as a gap in regulation from industries that were very lightly regulated in the past. The political calendar uh, also, you know, this is a, in a sense a bit of a political platform for Xi Jinping uh, leading into the party congress that's coming up next month and his third term. And then a shift towards more granular uh, industrial policy that's been incurring long term. That's also been discussed by the previous two speakers. So I'll conclude uh, with a few uh, outlook related observations. The first is that this is not a one firm crackdown. This is not a one time punitive set of regulations. This is a long term shift from a very lightly regulated technology sector outside of censorship, of course, uh, to a very highly regulated sector, which means much larger compliance costs for these firms going forward and less space to develop without uh, government action. A second is that the regulatory uncertainty at this point has probably peaked. Much of the legal frameworks around data and cybersecurity have already been created. There's still some uncertainty about how they'll be applied, but this is, this is largely peaked. Uh, however, the impact is going to be long-lasting. Uh, 
And uh, interestingly, initially when this campaign began, China's growth was quite strong and these firms were quite strong. So it was a bit of a headwind in a generally good uh, macro environment. But now you have a strong regulatory headwind in a weak environment that amplifies the negative effect on these firms and potentially on China's innovative capacity going forward. Uh, the third is that so far we don't yet see the benefits that China hopes to achieve with its antitrust actions. These firms are having to open up their walled gardens and share data with smaller platforms and interoperate better. Some of that might create positive growth in the future, but in the venture capital numbers, we're just not seeing uh, investment that looks to capitalize on that. And then finally, looking out to its impact on globalization. These actions are likely to contribute to some sort of splinter net where China has a largely separate internet than the rest of the world due to its controls on outbound data and the difficulty of complying with this storm of new regulation, which also applies to foreign firms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, for that fascinating uh, review of what's been happening in the big tech regulatory sphere. I'd like to invite our first discussant to come up to the podium now, Tianlei Huang. Tianlei, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So good to see an in-person audience back in our conference room today. Um, the presentations uh, given by Professor Pearson, Yiling, and Martin just now were very enlightening and inspiring. And they're also in a way complementary and showed us the complexities of China's economic structures and growth paradigm, especially how intertwined the state and the economy can be under Xi. In my comments, I wanted to add a bit more nuance to the discussion we're having about uh, this changing political economy in China by focusing on the role of the Chinese private sector. Uh, I'll make three points. The first point is that the changing political economy in China has not prevented the rise of the private sector, although it arguably has made that rising process more difficult. Earlier this year, my colleague Nicola Verone and I documented the rise of private sector companies among China's largest firms over the last decade or so. We looked at the Chinese companies publicly traded around the world with the largest market cap. We also look at uh, the expanding universe of the Chinese companies that make to the Fortune Global 500 rankings. What we found was that the private sector has been steadily increasing their presence in both universes under Xi, since President Xi came into power. In a way, this finding is a bit striking and perhaps not entirely intuitive, since uh, this is happening against the backdrop of a more status policy environment to the detriment of the private sector. However, one often overlooked fact is that private investment is still the majority of all fixed asset investment made in China. Though private investment has slowed quite dramatically since 2015 and even turned negative in 2019 and 2020 before there was a rebound last year. And retained earnings are an increasingly important source of investment funds for private companies given uh, the formal financial system has tilted the credit allocation away in favor of the, of the uh, state sector. Given that the private sector can invest a lot more efficiently than their state-run counterparts and generates greater return, it is only natural that the private sector has been growing more rapidly, gaining more revenue and market value than state companies, some of which are chronically making losses. The regulatory assault last year plus three events have led to a decline in the private sector shares in both market cap and revenue at the end of last year. But that drop appears limit, limited in magnitude, especially when you view it over, long time, uh, over a longer time horizon and is far from going back to the point of departure. And most recently, we're seeing a rebound of private listed companies from the low point uh, late last year. Therefore, despite the changing political economy, the rise of private companies in China has continued, which highlights re resilience of the private sector uh, amid repeated attempts of the party state to weaken it. Second, um, I think more clarity and evidence is needed to make the case that the boundaries between state and private are being blurred, or truly uh, being blurred. The most obvious way to blur the boundaries between state and private is obviously through uh, the state acquiring private company shares. Indeed, today, state actors, including SOEs, 
uh, all kinds of state investment vehicles, including the guidance funds, are buying and selling private company shares all the time. However, most of those transactions are minor and do not lead to changes in control status, control status meaning a company uh, being controlled by the state or private entity. The majority of the big listed companies Nikolai and I looked into have experienced zero change in control status over the past decade, despite constant changes in ownership structures here and there. And the average state ownership stakes in the largest listed Chinese companies have basically stayed unchanged in, uh, among the largest uh, companies over the last decade. There is indeed a rise of publicly traded companies uh, that do not have a clear controlling shareholder, but that is because of the increased levels of ownership diversifications. Other types of blurring between state and private are probably harder to measure and quantify. And they're manifested by the greater influence of the state in the private sector through means other than outright ownership, such as greater visibility of party organizations in uh, corporate governance. However, the party states attempt to exert greater influence over private companies and private entrepreneurs does not necessarily mean that private uh, companies' interest is now aligned with that of the party state. The Chinese system has long been founded on the supremacy of the ruling party, the ruling regime, and private entrepreneurs are constantly adapting to this unique um, and evolving political economy in which that they seek a balance between carrying out their commercial activities and fulfilling their political duties. And that political duty sometimes means that they have to practice certain political rituals and show loyalty. Almost all large private businesses in China have formed complex networks with local and central authorities and officials. But again, that does not suggest they carry the same objectives as the party state despite the latter's attempts. The third point I want to make is about what kind of a private sector she really wants, um, which in a way also is related to the second point I was making. The tech crackdown has led many to believe that uh, this new form of state capitalism that she is trying to forge includes a private sector that has more smaller com that has more smaller companies and fewer big ones, because the big ones have probably become too big to be politically benign in the eyes of the Chinese ruler, and the small ones are too important to growth and employment to be ignored. In other words, size matters, and becoming big is dangerous for Chinese private companies. But that view does not seem completely aligned with the events happening on the ground. Most visible state interventions in the private sector in recent years are concentrated in certain sectors. In the case of the regulatory rectifications last year, most regulatory moves the state has undertaken are sector specific and backed by logical public policy justifications. What was the most assaulting and detrimental to the private sector was this campaign style rollouts of new regulations across industries all at once with zero predictability and transparency. One direct casualty of this campaign was, of course, the sharp drop in market value of some of the most prominent private companies in China. But the sectors that were impacted by that campaign are only a small subset of the Chinese private sector. In 2021, among the 500 largest private companies by revenue, there were only 12 internet platform companies, according to this latest ranking published by the uh, All China Federation of Industry and Commerce. And actually, the majority of the private, com private sector companies in that ranking are manufacturing companies, which have not only avoided any kinds of regulatory assaults um, or visible state crackdowns, but also have kept uh, growing which was also in line with what we found when we looked at uh, the sectoral distributions of the largest listed private Chinese companies. So this generalization uh, that she wants a private sector with only uh, non-threatening small companies has probably gone too far. While there is indeed greater state uh, political control in almost every aspect of the Chinese economy and society now, state interventions in the private sector are more sensitive to sectors than to size. And being alone does not de being uh, big alone does not mean that a, co a private company is in danger of being targeted or uh, forced to downsize. Finally, I'd, I'd like to raise a question to the panel for further consideration. It looks like the enhanced role of the state has been institutionalized in many aspects of the economy and may be here to stay. So, what does it mean to China's future growth? 
Do we believe uh, that the party state capitalist system can continue alongside with private sector driven growth and innovation? With that, I'll stop and hand over to Nick. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm, um, I'm going to take the, uh, the title of our program uh, a little bit more directly about Xi Jinping's economic model. And I, uh, in contrast to some of our earlier presentations, which are uh, complicated and nuanced, I'm going to simplify. And I think the basic message of the reform period is that long-term growth has been explained largely by a shift of investment away from state companies towards private companies. Between 1980 and the time Xi Jinping came into power, the share of overall investment undertaken by state companies declined by half. It was over 80% uh, in the beginning of reform, and it fell to about a third uh, by 2012 when Xi Jinping came into power. This was the period of the most rapid economic growth. Now, there were lots of other factors, lots of other things going on, uh, and so forth. But even the imp increased importance of trade, uh, as Margaret pointed out, was partly because private firms became much more important in promoting and uh, achieving a rapid growth of exports. What happened after Xi Jinping came into power? Since Xi Jinping came into power, there's been this emphasis on state companies, there are lots of details about the party state and so forth and so on. But if you look at the big macro picture, uh, the share of investment by uh, state companies has risen and the share by private companies has fallen. The share of investment by private companies in the years up to Xi Jinping almost tripled. Uh, and since then, it's gone down. Now, as Tianlei just mentioned, it's still a little bit more than 50%. But when Xi Jinping came into power, it was almost, it was about 65%, maybe a little bit less. So the share of investment by private companies over the Xi Jinping years so far has been a pretty sharp uh, decline. I think part of that is due to the emphasis that she has placed on the importance of big companies, the merger of many big state companies to become even larger, the tilt of uh, bank credit in particular increasingly to state companies, uh, and uh, that has disadvantaged uh, private companies. This is all in the face of worse and worse performance uh, by state companies as measured by efficiency. The return on assets of state-owned companies has fallen by roughly half since Xi Jinping came into power. So they're getting more investment, but they're getting less efficient. So my basic conclusion is that well before we got to Xi Jinping's policy on zero COVID, uh, his economic model has generated a significant slowdown in economic growth. And so I think the question for the future, the one that uh, Tianlei was mentioning, is that, uh, you know, will that policy change? Will we see more space for the private sector? Will we see more access uh, to capital, uh, particularly from the, from the uh, financial system, banks in particular? Uh, for private uh, firms. I think there's plenty of dynamism in that sector. Uh, and as uh, Tianlei pointed out, uh, the platform companies have been substantially, uh, I don't know what the right word is, re-regulated or regulated for the first time, but there's lots of other space uh, for private companies in that space. I would say one more thing. Uh, Tianlei is right. Private companies have continued to grow uh, since Xi Jinping came into power, even though their share of investment has gone down. In part, it's the efficiency with which they employ capital. In part, it's that most investment in China continues to be financed with retained earnings. Private firms are more efficient, they're more profitable, and traditionally they have reinvested a large share of their profits. So they've grown more rapidly, particularly in the manufacturing sector. Now, when you start looking more closely at recent year or two, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. The private sector, particularly uh, in the last few quarters, has not grown more rapidly than the state sector. And the, the part of the problem has been that the service sector, which is very heavily populated by private companies, has been very, very weak because of the zero COVID restrictions. So people can't go out and buy things or their ability to order things online uh, 
and get them delivered is reduced. Uh, a lot of that is service sector uh, activity. And so the service sector, if you look at the official data, the service sector, we all know how weak growth has been recently, but in the second quarter, the most recent data we have, the service sector actually shrank. Uh, so that's where a lot of private sector activity is. So I think we have seen a little bit of a change most of the time under Xi Jinping. Uh, the private sector has grown more rapidly. Its share of the economy has gone up. But in the last few quarters, I think the pattern is beginning to change. And I think a real question is uh, whether or not that will continue. Thank you. Thanks so much to our speakers. I'd like to invite you all to the podium or the panel now for the uh, discussion phase of our program. just heard um, a lot and um, I'd like to begin by um, allowing Yelling and Margaret a chance to respond if they wanted to any of the discussion comments. Oh, my mic is on. So can you hear me? Can't hear me? Good. Good now? Okay. So please push the on button on your mic if you will. Um, Yelling, would you like to start? Sure. No, just very, very uh, briefly. Uh, one of the things that uh, Tianlei mentioned uh, that I think is really important to keep an eye on is this question of how well uh, state controls over firms can actually be carried out, right? And so I think we always just generally uh, need to keep an eye on the prospects that firms are not going to necessarily follow uh, what the state says. So uh, he, this um, uh, is a, something that we know that Beijing, the central government, uh, routinely has trouble enforcing exactly what it wants to happen. And I think the idea that it will always be able to control uh, firms uh, or that firms won't try to figure out ways in order to undo uh, or uh, uh, weasel out of some of the kinds of controls that are being put on it or the monitoring that's by the party state, um, we would be naive to think that uh, that's not likely to happen. Um, we were trying to talk about uh, earlier how we might measure that or how we might find it. And uh, I think we're mostly thinking anecdotally it is, is the most likely place to find it, but still it's worth keeping an eye on. But that also would suggest um, some implications for US policy, right? So if you think that every time Beijing says it's going to do something, it's going to be able to do it with um, efficiency uh, and without being undermined from inside, I think that also could be uh, somewhat naive. So I found um, all of the discussion absolutely fascinating. And it, it's, it's led me to kind of think back to the role of the private sector in, in China's reform history. And uh, I just have a few reactions. I think the first is if we remember uh, Ya Shengfang's um, very important work, right? When is the period, uh, when was the period where the private sector has been most dynamic in China? I mean, he would argue it was the 1980s. Right, and when we look back to that period, how clear was the distinction between the state and private? Right, these township and village enterprises were they clearly private companies? They were not. Right, so how you know? The, I think the boundary, this distinction between the state and the private, has always sort of ebbed and flow in in um, contemporary Chinese economic uh, history. One and, and therefore, the private sector in China has long had to struggle against a fairly hostile overall regulatory environment, although the hostility of that environment, again, has, has ebbed and flowed, right? As Kelly Sai's fantastic work uh, also documents, right? There are these red hat uh, 
capitalists who are very savvy at navigating changes in the overall political environment and policy environment to kind of push their, their um, interests forward. So one question um, building off of Margaret's fantastic presentation and Martin's uh, fantastic presentation is, you know, how does that agility still persist, right? So uh, Tianlei and Nicola's work suggests yes, right? And some of these private sectors and, and uh, private sector companies in China, China today are so successful because they're the ones who have survived some of the most hostile regulatory environments that can that can be found um, uh, in, in, in hugely competitive markets. What I, I wonder from Martin's presentation is that, you know, more recently we've seen the ability of the um, of government policies to really destroy a lot of uh, value, right? And from the government's perspective, you know, they might argue, well, this is not the good kind of value that we want to create in China. You know, what is good market value in, in, in China? Who dictates that? You know, is it driven by the private sector or is the, is the state increasingly able to, you know, through this rapid regulatory storms, um, exert a, a far greater effect than we've seen in, in previous years? Yeah, just following, following on that, two, two really interesting themes. One is kind of the regulatory environment and the other is whether private sector can push back on, uh, on the state. And this is, these are two things I address in a lot of detail in my book, The Cashless Revolution, which is out next month and everyone should read it uh, but, uh, and buy it. <laughs> but uh, that, that goes, so um, what's really fascinating about that space is that there was so much regulatory uh, encouragement actually given to, uh, to the financial technology sector that led it to grow and become so thriving and revolutionize the way finance was done in China. So in that case, actually, there was a very positive environment. And there's actually a time when Jack Ma is considering whether he's going to launch Alipay. And he, he actually calls his team the way he tells it and says, uh, I might have to go to jail for this. And he actually draws up a list of who would go to jail if this thing turns out to be illegal. Uh, and instead, what happens is this is encouraged to s disrupt the banking system because the government recognized that that was necessary. And they left that space unregulated for about five years with no regulation whatsoever. So in a sense, it actually became more conducive to, to innovation than, uh, than what existed in the United States because there was virtually no regulatory burden. But now as that's shifted, we've seen the excitement in China's financial technology sector kind of go away. And now the focus is a lot more on compliance and all the movement is on a central bank digital currency, which is run by the central government. And in my book, I have tons of anecdotes of actually these firms, these private firms pushing back against the government. One of my favorite examples is the government's trying to centralize credit data. And Alibaba keeps telling them year after year, we're still cleaning the data. We're still working on it. We can't give it to you yet. It's not ready. And the central bank some of the people in there have talked to me and said, we're so frustrated, we can't implement our own rules. But now in this new regime that we have, especially in the last two years, I get very little anecdotes now about the ability to push back against these kind of requests. So, so I do think there's a real shift going on and it is not conducive to innovation. Thanks. Um, I wanna just come back to Nick. Nick, your book, The State Strikes Back, The End of Economic Reform, actually ended with a question mark. Many people may forget that, <laughs> but it had a question mark. So uh, you talked in your remarks about the fact that the ROI of state companies had fallen by half, the continued skewing of investment, um, bank credit in particular away from private companies. Um, do you think we'll see a reversal of these policies given that they may be having a bigger and bigger economic cost? And along the same lines, um, you talked about the fact that the private sector was able to continue to grow because they're able to uh, invest out of retained earnings. But is that going to be enough to shift Chinese manufacturing to more capital intensive modes that we think are going to be necessary given continuing uh, relative cost increases in China and new competition from other parts, particularly of uh, uh, East Asia, ASEAN countries? Um, and is it going to be enough to provide the boost to invest uh, productivity that we're going to need to see in services to continue a growth rate that will 
uh, move China out of the, the middle income trap. So two questions, that question mark at the end, where are we with that? And secondly, is this um, retained earnings going to be enough to, to do what needs to be done over the next decade in Chinese manufacturing and services? <clears throat> well, uh, thank you for the questions, Mary. I think uh, I don't have an answer to the first question about whether or not reversal of this policies, uh, these policies is possible. Hopefully, I would be in a position to give some sort of an answer by the time we get to the National People's Congress next spring, when we know who the new premier is, when we know who the head of the new center, the new head of the central bank is, uh, when we know who's replacing Liu He as the kind of economic guru at the top of the system. I don't have any insights now uh, as to how those positions will be filled. There are lots of rumors going around. But I think that will be the best evidence of the possibility of an evolution in policy of the type that uh, Mary talked about, in which the private sector has better access to capital, uh, particularly uh, from the banking system. So uh, I'm in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> we look to you for that. I, I, thought, I thought they would have given up these policies a long time ago, but uh, the assumption of economic rationality is uh, not always uh, the best. Um, in terms of you know the you know whether or not the private sector can continue uh, to grow in the direction that Mary mentioned, uh, capital adequacy and so forth, I think the answer in the right kind of environment, the answer is definitely let yes. The private sector has a lot of capital stock now. It's grown up rapidly uh, since uh, the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s. The returns are relatively high. Uh, as Tenley mentioned, over half of all investment uh, in, the, in the whole economy is by private companies, and the vast majority of that is from retained earnings. So uh, I think it's there. There are still some regulatory issues. Um, but I, I, I'm less worried about uh, that than I am worried about the kind of the bigger kind of macro policy. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you, Nick, for answering that question. Um, you know, looking at it from a U.S. perspective, a lot of concern is about what it means for U.S. businesses. And Yelling, you mentioned about domestic mobilization going on in China and institutional reconfiguration. Um, you know, does this new approach, closed, a closed innovative architecture, imply a less welcoming or a more hostile environment for foreign invested enterprises? Uh, that's, of course, been a key source of support within the U.S. for engagement with China. Um, so it would be interesting to think about how, you know, this move by China will affect U.S. support for further engagement. So I think, I think that's, that's a really great question and something that uh, we'll have to keep a close eye on. I think two things. The first is that this broader move towards a closed innovation system has been confused a little bit. Uh, the facts on the ground have been confused a little bit by the dynamic zero COVID policy, right? That closure is different from the policy closure that um, the Chinese government is trying to institute on the innovation side. But right now, everything you know looks closed because of zero COVID. So if zero COVID gets lifted in the, in the future, we don't know when that will be, right? Then we might be able to see a greater this distinction and then it might be clearer to foreign companies um, based in, in China what the regulatory environment looks like. I think that a lot um, depends on what individual local governments want to do, right? So the national campaign right now is, is to move towards a more closed innovation system. As I mentioned in, in my presentation earlier, that requires massive coordination and cooperation from a diversity of actors, right? So you're asking private firms, if I can procure a foreign made uh, component that is cheaper and better, right? You're, the government is asking me not to do that but to procure something from, from within the system. Are they going to cooperate or will they find ways to, um, to, to bypass these regulations? Are local governments going to look for ways to reclassify what's counted as made in China, right, which, which already has happened? Right? If we see that happening, then I think that foreign, foreign businesses will still find a welcoming environment depending on which jurisdiction they're in. 
Um, but that remains to be seen because a lot is um, not clear right now because of zero COVID. Well, that certainly increases the burden for Western investors in terms of looking across space within China, across sectors, across uh, geographic space. Um, I wanted to turn to Margaret and, and ask her about the, to think about the future of U.S.-China relations through her lens. Um, do you think it's inevitable that integration will be diminished uh, between OECD countries and China because this integration itself is perceived as a security threat, um, not only by the West, but also by China? Are all commercial relations going to be cloaked in this security mantle? Or you mentioned a uh, focus on firms by size. Uh, Tianlei also brought in differences across sectors. And so can we expect sort of a, a, to use lack of another word, partial decoupling where security trumps everything in certain sectors um, or for certain firms, but integration still continues to thrive outside of those particular uh, channels? It's a great question. Um, I'm not so comfortable with um, crystal ball gazing, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, you know, I do think that there is uh, a strong haze of securitization for many uh, large firms, those firms obviously directly involved in security issues, but I think also for a lot of firms where it's not clear, you know, or where, where dual use is possible or where the lines such as in, you know, in, um, you know, internet and fintech and so forth, where it's abs actually not crystal clear to anybody sort of how much of uh, their technology could be converted to a sort of nefarious use by China if they got it. And I think th the technology itself suggests there's a lot of lack of clarity and uh, that is, uh, I don't think, going anywhere soon. Um, if it's just related to large companies, you know, I, I I, I think there is a spillover effect to small companies. So on the one hand, if you look at, you know, a CEO with business in China and they're not sort of in these sectors, you know, maybe loosely potentially touching on things having to do with data or whatever, you might say, okay, we'll just, we're just going to continue to go. I know of situations where the, the people on the ground and people in the municipalities, you know, really want them to stay, you know, where there's an attempt to say, first of all, wait until after the party Congress and also, you know, let's just, like, know that you're welcome here, you know, we love you, we think what you're doing is great. Yet the, the management has to worry about, about a spillover impact and the risk not only in China, but the risk here at home, um, because the risks to U.S. businesses are also going up from our own government with the securitization of it. So I'm not, uh, I, I think there's, there's going to be continued interactions, but I do think it's going to be reduced uh, overall. For better or worse. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. Just sticking with this idea about foreign in, um, investment in China, um, you know, Martin, you know that one of the goals um, of the Chinese government in the reform period was to increase competition, to use foreign firms as a source of competition to drive productivity improvements um, in domestic firms themselves. When we look in the tech sphere, um, do you think that... Uh, there'll be an ability of foreign companies to operate, or will the lack of competition uh, lead to oligopoly and perhaps uh, you know, much slower innovation uh, inside China itself because of this lack of competition and foreign exposure? That's a great question, Mary. So uh, what I find actually is that there's less protectionism than you would expect from China early on in the technology space. People kind of forget that Facebook actually was competing in China's market, and so was Google, and so was eBay in the early years and kind of the early and mid 2000s. And largely Chinese firms were doing a better job and getting a larger share of the market without a lot of government interference. And then later what happened is these firms are implicated in the Chinese mind with uh, protests in Xinjiang and such things, and they were then, then the Great Firewall was built out much better. But in, in many cases, the domestic firms were actually quite good at competing within that system. And one of the reasons you have so much success is that there really aren't any incumbent state players that have all of these barriers to entry uh, getting in their way. 
And that allows there to be a hyper competitive space where you actually have maybe if the US has a couple dozen firms competing in a new space, China will have a thousand. And the one that ends up coming out of that is one that has that is very competitive and strong. Uh, and China really worried that that was ending because we were getting to a more of a duopoly of two super apps that kind of controlled everything. And you had the mafia like, you know, you're either in the Tencent camp or you're in the Ali camp and you can't take investment from the other side and all that. They're really trying to break that down and increase uh, increase competition, but uh, that within China competition can remain strong while the competition with the rest of the world is weak. And the effect of that is that they're strong in China, but they can't really compete uh, internationally, except for TikTok. It's kind of the only case I'm aware of of a Chinese like software services company that's really managed to make a dent in anything. Everywhere else, WhatsApp, Facebook, Google completely dominate uh, Chinese competitors in every market outside of the mainland. Thanks, Martin. Let's take a question from the floor. Marcus Nolan. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed uh, the uh, presentations. I've always found these arguments about the state versus the private sector in China a little odd. Um, there's a third institution, the party. And in a Leninist political system, the party is supreme to both the state and the private sector. So I was very happy with Margaret's presentation, which started to address this issue. So my question is directed to her, but I welcome responses from every, everyone on the panel. What are the specific disciplinary mechanisms that the party can exert on people in positions within either state-owned enterprises or private firms? And what are incentives that the party can offer those individuals to comply with party directives or promote party interests as distinct uh, from whatever the interest of the particular enterprise or firm might be? Margaret, please. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that in many ways, um, the, the way I have often seen the party presence, or uh, I've also analogized this to uh, China's uh, representative presence in nearly every international organization that we see, you know, it can be there uh, perhaps latently, latently to be actualized when there's a need to actualize it. I think that uh, in many cases, um, in thinking particularly about this idea of party cells and party representation on the board of directors, um, it's really, uh, we don't have a clear pattern as to what other than presence and some kind of veto power that some uh, uh, management may have over um, issues if they don't like them, uh, that are veto power that's usually carried out privately, we don't really know what kind of uh, mechanism there will be or how much it has been used. And I also think, so that's a vague answer to say, I don't know, I'll take my strength from Nick to say, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, but I, I think also the question of who's controlling whom has to come up. Also, right. So, so it, if I were a um, uh, business person in China in a firm, and I, you know, had a party member on the board of directors, you know, I might want to figure out how to get that person to do what I want them to do, right? And so, I think we may we may misassign the direction of influence as being routinely from the party party state to the company, uh, it could go the other way as well as some scholarship has tried to show. So I'll leave it there. Interesting. Um, Barry Wood, please, your question. Barry Wood, uh, RTHK in Hong Kong. Two questions. One, the splinter net you mentioned, Martin, don't we have it already from what you just said? The absence of American firms or Western firms what are the implications of this continuing two internets? Secondly, in terms of China's efforts to expand their early lead in financial technology, how do the restrictions that have been placed upon Chinese tech firms impact China's efforts to develop a digital currency and provide or create an alternative to the dollar? in international transactions. 
Sure. So I'll take the, the second one first. Uh, in a sense, the, the restrictions on financial technologies development in China and the way that these tech firms can use their payment systems and build uh, has led them to want to expand abroad because there's less domestic opportunity for them to continue to deepen uh, what they're able to offer. But at the same time, this regulatory system that has made it less plausible to say that they're separated from state interests and state goals has made it more sensitive for, uh, for their attempts to go abroad. And many times they've had to pull back. So uh, Ant Group tried to buy MoneyGram in the United States. That was blocked by uh, CFIUS, which re over reviews um, investments into the United States. And all the way across the world, uh, even in places like Indonesia uh, and Nepal, there's been restrictions on these firms and their ability to build something out. So the interesting thing is this, this duality between their 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 desire to go out, but the limits there creates a challenge. With the state-backed digital currency, you know that's more. You know, all around the world, these interbank systems tend to have central banks standing behind them. And the dollar payments that occur around the world occur to a large extent because the Fed or the Federal Reserve Bank in New York stands behind those payments, even if they don't involve uh, U.S. counterparties. Uh, so, so there, the state influence isn't quite so different. And the interesting thing, the, another duality here, is that the extra controls on the digital currency might make them more willing to open up uh, and make the renminbi a little bit more freely usable than it is now because they feel they'll still have some residual control. Then the question is, will people abroad want to use a programmable digital currency that they might not be able to spend? And that, uh, that creates uh, some headwinds for them. Uh, on the Splinternet already existing, I think that's quite accurate. In the tech space, I think it's, it's very clear that China was actually the instigator of decoupling. And, uh, and for a lot of the reasons that Margaret laid out uh, in, in, her, uh, in her presentation, that you know, they don't want Snow, you know, Snowden showed the risks of relying on US technology. And they saw very early the impact that having a US company like Facebook in their market could have on their ability to control the way that uh, control the narrative. Thank you, Martin. We have one more question from the floor. Hi, uh, Ben Murphy, Center for Security and Emerging Technology, Georgetown University. Uh, one of my colleagues recently asked me, so Ben, what's up with zero, dynamic zero COVID? And I, I struggled to answer that because, you know, for, for the Communist Party, one of the ways that they legitimize their monopoly on power is by developing or delivering on sustainable, high economic growth and common prosperity for the Chinese people. And dynamic zero COVID is really hurting the Chinese economy. And I just struggled to answer that. I said, well, you know, Chinese people, uh, China has very high population density, so a pandemic is going to spread very quickly. Uh, the Chinese hospital and healthcare infrastructure isn't as advanced in the West, it'll be harder to deal with. And then, of course, China had the experience with SARS in 2003. And so both the leadership and your average Chinese person is much more concerned about pandemics, but still, I, that, didn't, that didn't seem to be enough to me to justify the, the cost that China is paying economically for dynamic zero COVID. So my question to the panel is, dynamic zero COVID, why, why is it still there? Why hasn't it changed to dynamic low COVID or dynamic manageable COVID? Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, this is a topical question because we hear today that Hong Kong has uh, eliminated hotel quarantine. So I'm going to send uh, toss this one down to Tianlei Huang, my a uh, colleague at Peterson who has recently written about uh, COVID. And spent several months. And lockdown. spent and several lockdown months in locked down in Shanghai. <laughs> so he has his personal well, experience to bring. Well, yeah, it was terrible. Um, <laughs> I was home. I'm from Shanghai. I was, I was back home visiting my parents for a couple months. And I <laughs> unfortunately went through the two-month citywide lockdown there uh, before I eventually uh, managed to come back to D.C. Um, well, like you said, public health is still the major justification that the party state is using to justify its zero, well, I don't care if it's dynamic or not, zero COVID, the attempt of zero COVID, the goal of it is to maintain zero COVID. Um, so whatever label we give it, it's a zero COVID policy and it's associated with mass testing, um, quarantine, uh, and lockdowns. Uh, and those are all extreme measures 
And I think it's um, it's not only a public health campaign, um, it's also a political campaign. Uh, it's a loyalty test for local authorities, for local officials, just months ahead of the big party uh, gathering later this year. Nobody wants to make mistakes that could threaten their political future. That's why we see whenever there is a couple of cases happening in a jurisdiction, they would result to very extreme measures, sometimes locking down the entire city, even if there is only one positive case in that, in that jurisdiction. Um, you also see the rise of local protectionism um, amid uh, the, this, uh, the recent surges of cases across the country. Um, my experience, because I have home in both Shanghai and Jiangsu province, and when, the, uh, when Shanghai was under lockdown, we were not able to travel to our other home uh, because there were walls, <laughs> concrete walls setting up uh, across, uh, around the borders that nobody is able uh, to cross. Um, of course, imagine that that causes a lot of problems in logistics, um, in everything, right? So, um, well, they are, they, they're seemingly to be uh, willing to make um, short-term sacrifices for the long -term, longer term gain, um, but there's um, no exit strategy communicated to the people whatsoever, um, even though they're constantly telling their people that uh, uh, the low vaccination rate among the vulnerable, vulnerable populations is still the major reason why they think uh, they should resort to extreme uh, lockdown measures, uh, but they they have um, communicated, uh, rolled out zero, nothing about how they're going to exit. A lot of people are speculating that the policy will probably end after the party congress, but <laughs> um, I have some reservations uh, on that. So, Thank you, Tianlei. Um, this brings us to the end of our program. The bewitching hour is here. I'm so happy we had this chance to take a deeper dive into China's economic model, how it's evolved, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to think about the implications of these changes for U.S. policy. Again, taking into account the richness, the granularity of the changes that are taking place in China. I'd like to thank our panelists today from my left, I always have trouble left, right, from my left, <laughs> Nick Lardy, uh, Yelling Tan, Margaret Pearson, Martin Trozempa, and Tianlei Huang. Thank you all, and thanks to our audience for joining us today.